Hey everyone, from wherever you're joining, welcome back to Super Science Saturday. This year we're streaming live from our homes and the NCAR Mesa Lab in Boulder, Colorado to yours. And we're really glad you all could be here today. Uh, so if you don't know about the National Center for Atmospheric Research or NCAR, uh, we're a world leading organization dedicated to studying the Earth system. And that includes you know, climate, weather, our atmosphere, our sun, and how all of these systems work together to impact society. If you're here for our previous segment, I hope you had an awesome time at the dance party. I know I certainly did. So a big shout out to Ali for pumping up the energy to get us going this morning. And I want to take that energy that we have now from the dance party to talk about instruments that we can use to do our science, as well as rockets. So here at NCAR, we love your questions about science. So throughout this segment, you can ask your questions through one of two ways. You can either use the Slido platform, and I'll go ahead and pop the link in the chat. Um, or you're, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can ask right in the Zoom Q&A. And we're going to have some time for those questions and answers a little bit later. And with that, let's get going and go hang out with Tim, Jeff, and Matt for It Really Is Rocket Science. It really is rocket science. And as the rocket science wizards right now to tell you about all the fun we had. And as Dan said, you know, instruments are the story of the atmosphere and those instruments the music instrument is in order to better understand what's going on through collecting data we live by the data the observations that we to understand what's going on and a little bit more i'm going to throw it over to jeff why is why is data so important Hi there, hello to the tens of thousands of you watching out there on the internet. <laughs> I'd like to uh, explain to you the importance of uh, weather data. Now, what's very interesting is that we know that we have surface observations, and there's are tens of thousands of those collected every hour. And if you consider all of the citizens out there collecting data, there are actually hundreds of millions of surface observations collected every day, which is fantastic. It helps us understand what's going on with the atmosphere. But the atmosphere is three-dimensional it has volume and we don't have citizens up in the atmosphere to collect data we don't have nearly as many sensors in the atmosphere to collect data and we need to be able to understand what the current state of the atmosphere is so that we can make accurate forecasts so all of our numerical weather predictions are our models that create these forecasts work much better if they have a very proper understanding of what the current state of the atmosphere is and so for us to get better forecasts, it's very important for us to understand not only what's happening at the surface, but what the temperature and pressure and moisture content of the atmosphere is all the way up from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. Now, here in the United States, we launch balloons every 12 hours from multiple sites in each state, but we only get about 150 different locations for these balloon launches. And so our information in the troposphere and the stratosphere is dramatically less than we have at the surface. And so these are, these are the reasons why we launch rockets or drop sounds out of airplanes or balloons to collect information about what's going on in the atmosphere from the top of the atmosphere all the way down to the surface. There we go. Perfect. So it's really, really important. And Dan mentioned the songs. We use is one of the instrument types that we use. And songs are actually, when you think about, if you think about your way, specifically hurricanes, drop songs are the workhorse of hurricane forecasting. They came right from NCAR. We started the work in the 1970s. Per, per, uh, perfected so today, those are what we use uh, they, right for the personal weather. Instrument? This is for the drop sound. Here. We are third to drop. This small cylinder is called a drop sound, or sound for short. And what a story it tells. It launches from an aircraft and falls through the air, gathering data about the atmosphere as it descends. It's a workhorse of hurricane forecasting dropping out of Hurricane Hunter airplanes right into a raging storm. Drop songs have a huge impact on understanding hurricanes and um, predicting hurricanes. 
Electrical engineer Terry Hoke and colleagues at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, have been designing, building, and improving Dropson technology for more than 30 years for a wide range of applications. This is the Dropson that the NSF aircraft use for our scientific research purposes, and it's also extensively used by the hurricane research uh, people. Compared to earlier models, today's SONs are lighter weight, relatively inexpensive, and loaded with sensors. And we actually have a temperature and humidity sensors down here at the bottom, and then we also have a parachute here at the um, top end of it. As it falls, the drop SON checks the pulse of its surroundings two times a second, including pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction. We're just taking these vertical slices of the atmosphere constantly as the SON falls. And you can see how the winds are in a circular pattern going around the hurricane. So the, the center of the hurricane is going to be in here. And they use this data, along with other data, to classify the hurricane. Hoke and his team custom fit aircraft with sond launchers, including this one for helium-filled balloon balloons. In 2010, American and French researchers deployed balloons over Antarctica that dropped 600 sonds to study atmospheric conditions and the shifting ozone layer over a four-month period. That has mapped the Antarctic atmosphere like it's never been done before. As the sun is falling, we're seeing every single little measurement uh, show up immediately on the computer screen. Such inside information is helping scientists learn more about the scientists learn more about the atmospheric conditions that spawn hurricanes. Hoke expects this will help forecasters make earlier and more precise predictions, giving people in the path of a killer storm more time to evacuate out of harm's way. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. the workhorse of hurricane forecasting drop zones and of course because we're wizards we thought what's if a drop is trying to go down i wonder what would happen if it went up and i think between uh jeff and i we probably have what would you say 50 25 how many years of building this model rockets together our combined history about, I've been building rockets for oh, about 45 years, and I know you have as well. We have, we're probably close to 100 years of rocket building. <laughs> 100 years of rocket building. We're like, well, what would happen if we put a drop on a rocket and shot it up into the sky? Just to get an idea of what that means, rockets, model rockets, come in all different forms. And some of you might remember this from Star Trek. Well, this is actually a model rocket that I built when I was 12, I think. The one difference you might notice is there's a little hole up here and a little catch in the back here. That's where we put in an uh, Estes model. Needs some repair work. You have to put in a little engine in there to get that thing going up. And that's one of the advanced rockets. The basic rockets look more like this one with a body tube, some fins, and a parachute and a nose cone to bring it down. And I thought, well, Maybe we could get a rocket that takes a payload like this one. Actually, this is what's left of the rocket, and the payload went up at the top. So we stuck the drops on on top of the rocket, and you're probably getting an idea of it didn't quite go so well, but we put a drops on on top of the rocket, and we sent it up into the sky. And it looked a little something like, oh, before, before I mention that, we, we thought, well, this would be great, but every time you come up with a science idea, you try to figure out if you can do it. And then the third step is to go and ask the safety people how to do this safely. And we literally went to Riva, who is golden, uh, and asked, like, how do we do this safely? So she went out to our Earth observing site, checked it out, and checked with all the scientists who have instruments could we launch a rocket out here and found out how to do that safely? And we even brought in Matt. To, if you're launching rockets, you need to have some way to put it out there. You're this creature. And uh, Riva and Matt on site, and all of a sudden, scientists for. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, we have the rockets here that we launched. Uh, I think we're getting ready to show um, 
some videos of us launching these rockets. Now, what's uh, incredibly important, as Tim was saying, is that you have to be safe with these. Uh, Colorado's been very dry lately, and so it's imperative that you launch these in places where there aren't long, dry grasses or other things that could catch on fire. And so we were taking the proper safety precautions at our Earth observation location, um, and we did take proper precautions. We had some fantastic rocket launches. Now, um, we did a test rocket launch uh, with this rocket that we did just to kind of test how the winds were drifting that day before we launched up the rockets with the sensors inside of them. So uh, here's a video of uh, some of the rocket launches. As it's going up, it will be sampling the air for temperature and humidity, pressure. Tim's carefully launching this on the launch pad. Inside here, we have the instrumentation. We're using a D engine for Estes rockets. Tim has smoothed the launch vehicle. It's got good rotation here. This is how we do science in wizard land. Okay, sky's clear. Three, two, one. Where's the parachute, Tim? Oh, it hit me Heads up, heads up, heads up! We got it back. <laughs> so, it didn't go quite like we wanted it to, uh, but you know, it's rocket science. It really is rocket science. And then we thought, well, if a pop science like that, uh, our wizard Matt here said, well, what about radio song and Matt do you want to talk a little bit about what you do sure yeah so I often help launch radio sons so we attach them to weather balloons so it's kind of the same idea as the drop sons except instead of dropping them out of a plane we attach them to a balloon filled with helium much like you would have at your party store at a birthday party and they get lifted up all the way up through the atmosphere and take those same measurements of temperature, pressure, humidity, and the winds um, so that we can know what's going on above our heads. Most excellent, yep. And we captured on video the, what we are, are stepping through to doing the radio sounds. So we'll go to that video and you can check out what it looked like as we sequence over to the radio sound rocket. Okay, here we are with our second launch. This is our radio sound rocket. We did our drop sound rocket uh, with Mac over here a little earlier. And that was a, it was a good rocket flight, maybe not a good sound flight. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're gonna try again, see if we get another good sound, I mean a good rocket flight, collect some data and see why the sounds are the way we actually do it uh, instead of with rockets. Matt helped us set this one up. So we've got a radio sound inside this rocket. This yep. is a different rocket because the drop sound rocket is done. Uh, not using that one anymore. It's done its job. It's done its yeah, job. That's right. Yeah, and we have a nice calm day for doing this. We uh, got some great data with the drop sound rocket, and that's on Mac's computer over there. And then we are collecting um, ground data, or we're collecting data with the radio sound from the trailer that's just over on the other side of the site here. So. We've got an engine in this bad boy. We're going to... Uh, what are the sampling rates of this, Tim? What are, yeah, Matt? what are the sampling rates on this, Matt? Uh, it should be one per second. One per second. One yeah, per one second. One measurement per second. So one hertz. Okay, fantastic. And we're measuring temperature and... Temperature, relative humidity, uh, pressure, and possibly winds based on the GPS location. Fantastic. What's the difference between a drop sonde and a radio sonde? Not much, but typically a radio sonde goes up and a drop sound comes down. That's really the big difference. They measure the same kind of parameters, but how you send it through the atmosphere, it matters. So we're the big difference for this between the drop sound and the radio sound is the drop sound's meant to go faster. So True. it measures at uh, twice a second instead of once a second.
<laughs> All right, so again, it didn't go quite like we wanted it. <laughs> yeah. um, but we did get data from the, the Radio Sun rocket as well. And uh, we, can, we can actually, we, we have the analysis uh, from that. And uh, it was pretty cool. We could uh, show you what it looks like to do the analysis right over in the trailer. Here we are, going back to the data collection site, see what happened with the, the radio rockets on, see what the data looks like, or if we got any data. Yeah. All right, here we are inside right. the trailer. Matt, what do we got? Okay, so this is the data that was coming in, so we can see that it's no longer because our radio sun now looks like this. <laughs> so it's not sending data anymore. Um, it looks like, according to this, it never detected that we launched it. So usually, as soon as you release it, it starts going up. This software will detect, oh, I'm going up because pressure is dropping. So it knows that it's been launched and starts recording data. But that didn't seem to happen this time, maybe because it all went too fast. Oh. Uh, it's also possible that we just lost the signal. As Mac said, these are supposed to go up a lot slower than on a rocket. So it's not meant to record that quickly. That may be what happened in this case, but the last measurement that we got was 28 degrees Celsius, 15% uh, relative humidity, so pretty dry for here in Colorado. And this blue line is the pressure. And actually, if we zoom in here, this was the pressure at the, just on the ground there. And you can see the pressure did actually drop and come back Look up a that. little bit. So we did probably measure data. It just didn't know that it had launched. You can see the temperature dropped a little bit, pressure dropped a little bit, relative humidity went up. So we actually collect data just in that tiny little bit. <laughs> so how many, how long is that? Is that a split second worth of data that we got there? Oh, let's see. Yeah. Um, 3178 to about six seconds, five or six seconds worth of data. Six seconds worth of data. Look at me, Matt. <laughs> there we go. But we actually measured the pressure drop at the very least and a change in temperature and humidity. So That's awesome, dude. Yeah. All right, so there you go. We uh, did a little science out there and had some fun while we were, while we were making it happen and learned some things uh, about what it means to put a sand on a rocket and how that all works out. Matt, would you like to like talk about the, the drops on data, what that looked like? Sure, I can do that also. I think we have a plot here that we're going to show. Um, and so... Perfect. Yes. So these are some of the things we measured with the drops on. So on the left, we have the pressure. The middle graph there shows the temperature. And the right shows humidity, which is just a measure of moisture, how much water is in the air. So the blue lines show our measurements as the rockets were going up. So we can see there that pressure was decreasing from the left side, from the right side of that graph to the left. <laughs> uh, the pressure was decreasing as it went up. The temperature also decreased as it went up. And humidity actually sort of increased as it went up. And then the red lines show the rocket coming back down. So again, we see that pressure increased as we went back down, as we would expect in the atmosphere. Temperature actually continued to decrease. We don't usually expect that. So that probably tells us that it's not a very good measurement. Uh, and the humidity also continued to increase, which we don't really know quite what that means. But this goes to show that rockets are probably not the best way to gather these measurements. Excellent. Yeah, so, you know, wizards were a little edgy. And uh, we did the science that... Maybe the uh, scientists wouldn't normally think of doing, but we got it done. <laughs> it, it might not be the best way to collect the data, but it sure was a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it was. It definitely was. And I wondered if we have any questions from people who are watching us. We'll check in. So I'm not seeing any questions yet. Definitely pop them either into the Slido 
um, or the or the Zoom chat. But I had a question for for, for y'all. Did so? Did you make these rockets yourself? And if so, how did you build them? Ah, well, uh, yes, we did actually make them ourselves. And the well, we modified them as I brought this up earlier. This was a standard Estes rocket with a payload section at the top. And we simply replaced that payload with the, the drop zone, which is this circuit board. And normally on top, there would be the sensors to actually collect those data. And then we this one. We this one from scratch because we had to have a bigger tube in order to get the radio sun in there. And you can see where we had a big problem on the landing. It didn't come down so well. No, it's gonna not sure where that is. So yeah, this was a a specifically built. Once you've worked on rockets for a long time, you get to a point where you know exactly what the, the parameters are for making a rocket that works because it's rocket science. Um, and <laughs> then I checked in with Jeff and, Jeff, do you remember the engine issue that we had? Uh, which engine issue was that? We had many <laughs> engine issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had, we had some trouble getting them started, but we also didn't have a powerful enough engine. So one of the rockets came down, well, both of them came down a little bit faster than we wanted, and the uh, chute didn't deploy. So two, two, two different problems we had with the, the engines and the chutes. Yeah, we were hoping to use the larger E engine, but we ended up using the D engines. Estes Rockets makes engines all the way up to Qs and Rs and and those are done by actual people who are actually using rockets to measure the atmosphere. They go up 100,000, 150,000 feet up. Uh, it's phenomenal. You know, ours was kind of a, a fun kind of thing. But, you know, real rocket science, they're using big Estes rockets, uh, <laughs> Qs and Rs, and going 100,000, 150,000 feet up. So maybe we'll do that next time. There we go. And one of the unique things we had to be careful of is all of the instruments that surround that surrounded our launch site, which are in development and testing right now. One of them is set to go to Antarctica to collect data from there. And uh, we have a, there's a huge radar just uh, near us and a collapsible tower. So what we had to do was the launch on the days when the wind were calm, and we happen to have one of the best meteorologists in Colorado as a wizard, Mr. Weber, uh, who set us up and he said, we were out there ready to launch. And I said, Jeff, when are the winds going to die down? Because it was a little breezy. And he said at 9 o'clock, guess what, 9.05, they started to taper off. We were good to go. So well done there, wizard. <laughs> so we did have a, a question pop up in the chat. It might be the last one we have time to answer for John. Based on what you learned, what would you change if you were going to do this again? Ooh, I'm going to throw that over to Matt and Jeff. What would you do differently? Well, I think for one, a larger rocket or a bigger engine to get up higher, because we really would like to know what's happening even higher up. Um, secondly, maybe we would design our own instrument from scratch that could take these measurements faster. Like I said, the radio sonde only takes measurements once per second, but the rocket goes up really quickly. So if we could measure more quickly than that, maybe 10 measurements per second, we could get some really good data. Yeah, and, and something that I might suggest is maybe working on our parachute deployment. Um, it was kind of a hazard having those come down at full speed and we would have collected significantly more data with a large parachute and then floating down. We would have had much more time in the air and we've been able to collect more data. So maybe a bigger engine and a, and a bigger parachute so we could collect more data. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, and I'm going to squeeze one more question in here from Violet. Um, and they're wondering, can rockets be uh, too big so they don't work? Well, you know, rockets, they have weight. And so as long as you have a, a big enough engine to lift the weight on the rocket, it will work. For example, the Saturn V, the biggest rocket ever made by NASA, is you know, hundreds of feet tall and weighs millions and millions of pounds. And yet that's what got our astronauts to the moon. And so when you compare our one pound Estes rocket to the hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds of a Saturn V rocket, there's, there's a lot of difference, but yet they still work with the same physics. You still have a rocket engine that is exerting a force and then the action, the reaction going in the opposite direction. And so no matter how big the rockets are, they still kind of maintain the same physics mentality 
And so as long as you have a really big engine, you can watch a rocket as big as you want. Yeah. You also have to consider where that, the weight is dispersed across that engine, that rocket's body. Because it is possible to get a rocket that doesn't go up and spirals and goes sideways. So there's a, there's a, I would highly recommend, if you're interested in checking out the Estes rockets, to get started with the baby steps and work your way up to, like Jeff said, some really, really big rockets. All right, but th this was really cool. I mean, who, who doesn't like attaching stuff to rockets and launching <laughs> it into the air, right? <laughs> um, so with that, uh, Tim, Jeff, and Matt, thank you so much for telling us all about drop songs and radio songs and attaching them to rockets. Um, and as you heard in the show, you know, don't launch a rocket unless you're doing it safely. Um, so our next show is going to start at the top of the hour, 10 o'clock mountain time, and we hope to see you there.